Exodus chapter 20. Today I'm going to begin a series on the Ten Commandments. Let me say up front that I have broken all ten of these commandments. But you know what? God's blood cleanses us from all sins. And so I can tell you that I'm clean today through the blood of Jesus. So you don't have to live in guilt. As a matter of fact, when the blood of Christ cleanses us, it cleanses us not only from the sin, but the guilt of sin. For it is the guilt of sin that separates us from God. Do you know when I struggle in my prayer life? It's when the devil is reminding me of sin and I feel guilty. And so this morning, there, there are several reasons why I'm preaching this. One is we need to know the Ten Commandments. We need to know them. We need to know what they mean. And we need to, to allow God's power in us to allow us to obey the Ten Commandments. But the truth is, all of us have broken. And I'm going to say most of you have broken all of them. And I'm going to tell you why I believe that in just a little bit. And that's why it's, it's good to hear these things because we know that we're all in the same boat. We've all sinned. You say, Brother Carl, are you saying you've committed murder? The Bible says the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not do murders or thou shalt not kill. Actually, it's, it's to do murders because there are times when it would be justified to kill. But it says thou shalt not do murders. But you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, if you hate your brother without a cause, you have committed murder in your heart. And you know what? I've done that. The Bible says that if a man looks upon a woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery with her already in his heart. I've committed that sin too. So I can tell you that I'm guilty of all of them. But the blood of Christ has cleansed me. So uh, I don't want you to feel guilty unless you need to feel guilty. Guilt is a good thing if you need to feel guilt, if you haven't repented. Now if you've repented, you don't have to feel guilty. But if you haven't repented of your sins, you need to come to Jesus. Most people today think, well, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, I'm a pretty good fella, so I'm going to heaven. That is not how you go to heaven. Because you've already, you're already guilty. Well, you know, God's loving, he'll let me go. You go before a judge guilty of crimes and see if he'll let you go. If he does, he's not a, a righteous judge. He's corrupt. Ted Turner, how many of you know who Ted Turner is? I don't know what happened to Ted Turner. Years ago, he used to be a pretty conservative guy, but boy, he's really gone off the deep end. I guess that's what happens when you marry uh, Jane Fonda, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, here's what uh, Ted Turner said. He said, we're living with outdated rules. We're trying to live by the Ten Commandments, and he said, the Ten Commandments are out. That's what Ted Turner says. That's not what the Bible says. Let's look up on the screen. Let's look at this together. We're going to look at the very first commandment today and see what it says. And God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of Egypt, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Boy, there's a lot just in that little, little statement there. Some people say, well, you know, Brother Carl, the Ten Commandments are not for us. We're in the New Testament. That was Old Testament. So the Ten Commandments are not for us. You know, there might be a clue in the fact that God wrote this in stone. You think that might tell us something? You've heard the saying, well, it's not like it's written in stone. Well, you can't say that about the Ten Commandments because they were written in stone. And also, not only that, but they're in the Ark of the Covenant. Now you say, Brother Carl, where is the Ark of the Covenant? I don't know exactly where it is. I've got some speculation, but I don't know where it is, but I know inside the Ark are the two tablets. You know what America needs to do? Take two tablets and call God in the morning. Amen? But there's two tablets in that Ark of the Covenant, and it was so important that God wanted it saved. So let me tell you something. 
the Ten Commandments are not done away with. They're still vitally important. And this first commandment is so important. It says, you should have no other gods before me. Why is it important? I think one reason, he put it first. When you put something first, that shows it's pretty important. Not only is it first, but it is foundational. Really, it is the key to what we believe. Is Jesus your God? I tell you, I, I mentioned sometimes I struggle when, when I see people not committed to the Lord. When I see people that it's just a, a lackadaisical, yeah, you know, the things of God aren't really important to them. How do you think God feels? I mean, today is the Lord's day. Think of all the people out there that are gone fishing or doing their own thing or living in pleasure and saying uh, they don't even give a thought about God. And He made them. He created them. And He is the King of the universe and they don't give a rip about God. How do you think that makes Him feel? I think it makes Him feel sad, but one day it's going to make Him feel mad. The great day of God's wrath is coming. Now you won't hear that much, but I tell you, we need to be telling it everywhere we go that there is wrath to come and people need to flee from it. Now, why did God give us the law or the Ten Commandments? I think there's two basic reasons. One, He wanted us to know He is holy. Boy, you don't hear that much today, do you? You know, God's just, uh, you know, up, the man upstairs and we just have a nice, listen, we need to tremble for a holy God. We need to reverence the Lord God. In our worship, when we witness and all that we do, we need to realize God is a holy God. And number two, we need to see the sinfulness of us. Let me tell you something. In my flesh, there's no good thing. Let me tell you something. I am prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Listen, our old flesh does not like God. And if you're in the flesh right now, you don't want to be here. You don't want to hear this sermon. You'd rather be home in the bed. You'd rather be reading a paper. You'd rather be watching TV. You just, uh, maybe you're here for out of guilt or something, but it's not because you love Jesus. And let me tell you something. God knows your heart. God knows your heart. You know what? I, I want people to love Jesus. I want people to obey Him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's the motive for keeping His commandments. Now, I want us to look at this first commandment today and I, I want us to learn some things. We're going to look at all of these. And let me say this to you parents. Sometimes, I, I have parents come to me and uh, say, you know, I'm not sure if my child's saved. You know, they made a decision, but I, you know, you, I haven't seen much change. I know I went through that. I'm still going through it with a couple of my kids, you know. But uh, especially Lacey, you know. Uh, I'm teasing. But, uh, but, you know, you wonder about your children. And I tell you, sometimes I preach where if, if you made a decision in camp or vacation Bible school, but there's no change in your life, then I doubt you're really saved. And I tell you, parents don't like to hear that because they want to be reassured. They want to know, yeah, I'm, I, I'm sure he's saved. He went forward during the revival or something. And they're trying to uh, assure themselves when there's no evidence in their children's life. But here's what I say to parents. You want to bring your children to Christ, teach them the Ten Commandments. That's what the, 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 the law is. It is a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. But look at the first commandment. And the Lord spake all these things. First of all, he said, I am the Lord God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. See the thou? That is a person, we would say you. In other words, what God is doing is he's saying, Lacey, I am your God. Is there anything before me? Am I first in your life? David, I am the Lord your God. Is there anything in your life that you put before me? 
You see how personal it gets? Cindy, I'm the Lord your God. Is there anything before me? Let me tell you something. There should be nothing before God. Let me tell you something. He will not accept second. You know, I like a lot of other things. And I like the Lord, but there's some other things more important. God will only be number one. Or He won't be in your life at all. You must make Him number one. So I want to ask you a question. Who's first in your life? Who's first? Your mama can't be first. Your daddy can't be first. Your husband can't be first. Your wife can't be first. Your children can't be first. No other relationship can be first in your life. As a matter of fact, Jesus said this. He said, except you hate your mother and father. Boy, I read that and I said, whoa. Jesus is telling us to hate Here's what he's saying. Your love for me ought to be so great that all your affection for every other relationship looks like hate compared to your love for me. It's kind of like a guy riding a bicycle down the street and you're in your car and you pass him. You look in the rearview mirror and it looks like like he's going the other way. He's not. He's going the right way, but he's just going with a lot less horsepower than you are. So it looks like he's going backwards, but he's really going forward. It's just you're going forward a whole lot uh, faster. And so our love for God ought to be like we look in the rearview mirror and all our other relationships when we look to God seems like hate. Do you love God? Is God first? Abbott and Costello used to do a routine called Who's On First? Any of you ever heard it? It's very confusing. It's funny stuff. Uh, Who's on first? Well, I want to ask you, who's on first in your life? Who is on first? But first of all, today, I want you to see God's requirement. It's very simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. You just make God the God of your life. You make God number one in everything. It is the nature of man to worship something. And I'll tell you, all these people, and and they may not give a rip about God, they may not even think about God, but I'll tell you what, they're worshiping something. They're worshiping something. It could be the God of pleasure. That's the big thing. You know, I deserve to have a good time. I deserve to have some fun. I work hard, and I just deserve to do what's best for me. Wrong. You need to do what God wants you to do. You need to obey God. The God of pleasure. And by the way, you know how I can tell what your God is? I could, one, I could look at your checkbook and I could see where you spend your money and that would give me a clue of who your God is. If you spend most of your money on entertainment, I'd know your God is entertainment. If you spend most of your money on sports, I'd know... Your God is sports. If you spend most of your money at the golf course and on golf, I can tell you your your God is golf. If you spend most of your money on fishing equipment, then I can tell you your God is is fishing. I'm going to pick on Tim. Not this Tim, but the Tim that's usually back there. Since he's thousands of miles away, so I can talk about him. Now, I have never looked at Tim's checkbook, but I believe this. If I looked at his checkbook, you know what I'd find? He's buying books on the internet. He's buying books that'll teach him about God. He's always saying, Brother Carl, I got this book, and it tells me about God, and, and it's, it, I got this book on theology, and I got this book on this. And you know what? I have no doubt who his God is. Because his, his, where he spends his money is on the things of God. He just can't get enough of God. Wouldn't that be great? Some people can't get enough of uh, uh, NASCAR or something. Man, and, and I'm not saying these things are wrong in their place, but they're never to be above God. So it could be the God of pleasure. It could be sensual pleasure. It could be entertainment. It could be sports. What is it that is first in your life? Could you say, if I went up to you and I said... 
Is God first in your life? What would you tell me? You might say yes, but I'd say, well, let's prove it. Let me tell you another thing. If I looked at your calendar, if I looked at your uh, day planner, and the day planner um, showed me where you spent your time, You know, God, God can see us all the time and God's going to, one day we're going to stand before God and God's going to say, look at that, how many hours you spent watching a box. Now, I watch some TV. I watch 24. I don't know, I may not watch it next year, but I'm, I watched it this year, okay? Anybody, anybody else likes 24? I like it because the bad guys get blown up, okay? And that's of God, you know that. But I don't, want to, I don't want to stand before God and God say, you just sat there in front of a box for hours and hours and hours when there's things I could have done to help people, the things I could have done to serve God. And so we need to be careful. How do you spend your time? Hunting and fishing? Again, I'm not saying that it's wrong to go hunting and fishing. It is wrong to go too much. God of pleasure. It could be a God of possessions. What do you live for? To accumulate stuff? To have a big house? So that you'll have a nice car? Let me tell you something. It's all going to be gone when you stand before God. It's not going to matter. It is so overrated. Stuff is so overrated. It will never make you happy. You think, well, if I, just, uh, uh, if, if I just had a nice home, I'd be happy. Listen, I'm, I've got a nice home now. I think it's pretty nice. But we lived in a duplex. I was just as happy in the duplex as I am now. As a matter of fact, it was less to clean. And that makes me happy. You see, it's so overrated. You'll work and work and work and save and save and save. And let me tell you something. Jesus said this. Don't store up riches for yourself because they're uncertain. And boy, is he right. Just look at the stock market. One day you can think, boy, I'm in good shape, man. I got all this money and zoop. And now there's people that thought they had it made, a secure retirement. It is gone. Let me tell you, there's only one security, and that's in Christ Jesus. If Jesus doesn't take care of me, I'm in big trouble. But he said he would, and I believe he will. The God of plans. What's your plans for your life? When I was 18 years old, I accepted Christ as my Savior, and I'll tell you what, my plans changed. They weren't very good plans to begin with. But we have to come to the place where we say, listen, all that matters is that we obey God. Listen, we're all going to stand before God. Do you realize that? Do you believe me? When I say it, that we're going to stand and God's going to say, here is your life. Here is what did you do for me in your life. You only had one life. I gave you 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years. Whatever amount of time I gave you, what did you do for me? Can you imagine the people that live totally for themselves? totally for what they could accumulate in this world and they didn't live for the other world. I tell you what, that I fear that. Well, Brother Carl, I don't believe you ought to be afraid of God. You don't know God. He is the awesome power of the universe. There is a part of me, one reason I'm preaching here today is because I fear God. One reason I started this church I tried to talk God out of it. He wouldn't go for that. And I was afraid if I didn't, I'd be in rebellion against God and I don't want to be in that position. I keep reminding God from time to time, remember God, this was your idea. <laughs> and I tell you, I'm thankful for it. We've got... Uh, Maybe 12 or 13 people that have been baptized that if we hadn't started this church, they may have gone to hell. If that's all we ever do when we're in heaven and I just look at those 13 people and say, praise God. Praise God, I obeyed. 
Number two, what is God's reason? God says, I want you to put me first. But why, Lord? Why does God want me to put him first? First of all, because he is God. He said, I am the Lord your God. I'm God, act like it. I am your God. I made you. I am the king of the universe. I made you. Now you yield to your king. Is he your king? Is he your king? Do you even pay him any thought? Do you read his word? Do you read it saying, God, tell me what to do. I'll do whatever you want to. You're the king. I'm your servant. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do, Lord. Is that your heart before God? Or do you just think about him on Sundays? Do you talk to him? Do you spend time with him? And I tell you, some of you struggle in this and it's either two reasons. One, you got sin in your life or number two, you've never been saved. You know what? When I got saved, nobody had to beg me to come to church. You couldn't keep me out of church. I wanted to learn about Jesus. Our old pastor, Brother, Brother Jeff, used to say, I don't find it here where I got to beg Christians to come to church. Really, we shouldn't have to, should we? There ought to be a desire to say, I want to go and learn about Jesus Christ. I want to learn. I want to be with my brothers and sisters. I want to fellowship with them and talk about the Lord and talk about the things of God and grow in my spiritual life. Why should we put Him first? Because He's God. Number two, because He's what, what He's done for us. He said, I am the Lord your God who led you out of bondage, who led you out of Egypt. You know what God's saying? You ought to put me first because of what I've done for you. You realize what God has done for you? He loved you. He left heaven for you. He died on the cross, a awful torture, suffering and pain like you cannot imagine. Not only his body, but his own soul suffered. He is worthy of us putting him first. Before you leave this place, before you walk out that, that door, God ought to be first in your life. You ought not leave here without getting that straight. Saying, God, you will be first in my life. And then number three, what is man's response? How do we respond? When God says, I want to be first. Well, Lord, you know, I, I, I love so many things. Lord, there's so many things that give me pleasure. Let me tell you something. There's been times in my life, and I'm ashamed to say it, but since I've gotten saved, there have been times in my life where other things have creeped into my life and taken a place of dominance in my life. Where I could say, oh yeah, I love Jesus. Oh yeah, Jesus is first in my life. But you looked at my checkbook, you looked at my schedule and you would see it was cluttered with all other things apart from God. And I tell you, God had to get my attention. And God had to say, I am not first in your life. It's easy to say it, but I, I'm asking you this morning, examine your heart, every one of us. Because we're all tempted to this. We need to examine our heart and say, what is it that I love that rivals? Jesus said, I will have no rivals. Nothing should even come close to me. But put me first. So what do we have to do? We've got to tear down all those things, tear them out of our heart. I remember one night in my bonus room, I went before God and I said, God, 
I'll be honest with you, there's some things I love and I don't know if I can give them up because I love them so much. They bring me such joy. They bring me such pleasure. I, I have fun doing them. But Lord, I feel like this rivals you. This rivals you. And I said, Lord, I want it out of my life. And Lord, I'm so hooked on these things. And by the way, they don't have to be bad things. They can even be good things. But when you love them too much, they become in the place of God. And I said, God, would you give me grace and help me to get this thing out of my life? And I remember one day, I went down to Coleman Park. And I was so sick of me. You ever been sick of you? I just didn't like me because of, there were things in my life I didn't like. There was pride. Oh, let me tell you, I struggled with pride. I was sitting here a few minutes ago struggling with pride. And I just had to say, oh God, forgive me. You know, you think I've been saved now over 30, 37 years, 38 years, I believe. You'd look like, it looks like I'd get some victory over that and I have gotten better, but the truth is it still comes into my heart. And I have to repent of my pride. You see, one of the things, you know, because we have several people out today and, that, and, and I was feeling, oh man, I, and, and I had to realize, you know what, that's pride. It doesn't matter who's here, who's not here. I'm here for Jesus. I'm here to please God. But my pride wants us to have a good attendance. That is just plain old sorry, stinking pride. I confess it. You pray for your pastor because I need it and I'll pray for you. But sometimes pride gets a hold of me. And so what do you do? You say, God, tear it out of my heart. God, help me. I can't, I am so sinful. I can't even... Get rid of certain things in my life without the help of God. But you know what? God will help us. And so you must repent of anything in your life that rivals God. And then you have to yield. I was telling you about Coleman Park. I, got I went to Coleman Park. I was so sick of myself. I was in evangelism and teaching and preaching and uh, Sometimes these thoughts would come to my mind. It's like, boy, I want to I get a good number of people saved. And, 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 and not, not necessarily for the glory of God, but just so I would feel good. I would feel like God's using me and it was all for my flesh. And then, here again, pride. I'd be praying for revival. Dear God, I, I remember I was in a, a, a church service. I wasn't preaching. But we were in a revival meeting and uh, everybody's talking, you know, at church, you know, how everybody's talking, shaking hands. And, talking. and I'm sitting here by myself and I begin to pray in the chair. And I'm praying, God, help us have revival. God, move on this place. And God, let there be real conviction. And I was just praying. And you know what? A thought came to my mind. Look at these other people. They're talking while I'm praying. You must be a pretty good Christian. Yeah, here you are praying for revival while they're talking about a bunch of baloney that doesn't matter. And you, you know what that is? That is pride. And it may have been started by the enemy, but I sure enjoyed it. And so I had to just say there, I said, what am I doing? I said, Lord, I am so full of pride that right here in the holiest place, doing the holiest thing, I can still have pride in my heart. Even in the solemn throne room of God as I was praying I had pride I had to ask God to forgive me so what is our response first of all if you if God shows you something in your life that you love that competes with God you need to first of all repent of that and second of all you yield to God Right there in Coleman Park, I was so sick of me. And I said, God, I am so sick of my pride. I just told him what all I was sick of. And I said, God, I want a pure heart and holy hands. 
Oh God, give me a pure heart. Lord, I want to be holy. I want, I want to be holy, God. I want you to clean me. I want you to do something in my life. And I stayed there for hours. And I sat on the picnic table. And then I walked around the park. And then I sat down at a, at a swing. And over and over again, oh God, you've got to do something in my life. I want to be holy before you. Oh God, I want to be clean. I want to be a holy man. I want to be a man used of God. Whatever time I have left on this world, Lord, I pray that I would give you glory and honor. God, you've got to do something to me. God, you've got to do something to me. And I got a phone call from a preacher friend down in Alabama. And he said, just thought about you. I wanted to call you. He said, I wish we could get together. I'd love to talk. And, and we had some wonderful times. We'd sit and talk for two or three hours at a restaurant. And I said, well, where are you going to be? Maybe I'll come down to hear you preach and we'll talk. He said, I'm going to a conference. Heart Cry for Revival conference. And he said, it's in North Carolina. He said, as a matter of fact, i got a room. You could stay with me. And, and he asked me if I, if I could work it out and... So I worked it out and I went there. And while I was there, I told him, I said, he said, what do you need, Carl? Why are you here? And I said, I need God to do something in my life. I need a touch from God to make me holy. I am sick of my pride. I'm sick of my sin. I want God to, to give me victory. And we prayed every night afterwards. We got together and we got beside the bed and we prayed. The last night of that conference, Jim Cimbala. Any of you heard of Jim Cimbala? Brooklyn Tabernacle. Great preacher. Great man of God. He preached. And he preached on being filled with the Holy Spirit. The faith to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when he started preaching, it was like the Holy Spirit said, here's why you're here. You better listen to this guy. The other stuff was good, but here's why you're here. And I listened and God spoke to me. And he said, if you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you come forward. And I came forward. And all these preachers, we put our hands on each other. And we prayed. And when I got through praying, I looked at my preacher friend. And I just looked at him and I said, God just filled me with the Holy Spirit. And he looked at me and he, I, he didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. And I said... The Bible says that if you ask your father for bread, he will not give you a stone. And if we ask God for the Holy Spirit, he'll give it to us. Now let me say this. When you're saved, you get the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit may not have all of you until you surrender everything. And in that part, I believe I surrendered everything to God. And it wasn't but a few days later till God did a work in my, my life. And what happened to you, Brother Carl? I didn't speak in tongues. I didn't fall out on the floor. I did, I did have this, I just had this new desire to praise God. And I, we sang and I praised God. But I tell you, I was different because I had victory. And my family will tell you, I came back, that was about four years ago, and I came back and they said, Daddy's different. Daddy is different than he used to be. Why? I had to come to the place where I yielded everything to God. I said, God, I'm going to change my schedule. God, I'm going to change what I love. Let me tell you this one story and I'll be through. There was a preacher in Chattanooga named Wayne Barber. Some of you may have heard of him. He's a pretty well-known preacher. But he tells his story how one summer he went to to camp, to youth camp. He signed up for youth camp to take several churches and their young people to camp. But he says this, the only reason I went to camp is because they had one of the best lakes and I love to fish. And he said, we went through the, through the first day of camp, we did our activities, did our crafts, did all our activities, had a service that night, all the kids went back, went in their bunks. He made sure they were all asleep. And when they were asleep, he got his tackle box. He got his fishing pole. And he went out there and he fished all night long. He loved it. So the next day, activities, and he is dead tired. 
He said, I am dragging and I go into the church and I'm half asleep and the guy gets up and he preaches on is God first in your life or is there something else that competes with him? And he said, oh God, forgive me. I'm giving these kids an old tired preacher because I love fishing so much. And that's the only reason I came is to go fishing. And I fished all night and here I am. I'm not serving you well because I fished all night. He said he got up from that sermon. He went to his cabin. He got his fishing poles. He got his tackle box. He walked out to the lake. And he threw him in the lake and he said, no more. No more. Jesus is first in my life. And I tell you what, he'll tell you after that day, God changed his ministry, God changed his life, and God began to use him in a powerful way. Now I know some of y'all don't want to hear that. Well, I don't think you have to give up everything. Listen, you have to give up everything. There can be nothing that competes with God. Now I know you don't want to get rid of it. You want to hold on to it. But as long as you hold on to to that, you'll never have the fullness of God working in your life. Who's on first in your life? Who is first place? Is Jesus Christ first? Or is he second? Or maybe third? Or he may even be fourth? Or he may be way down. Oh, how it dishonors our King. One day we will stand before Him. Is He first in your life? Let's bow for prayer.